Chapter Seventeen of Preferred Risk by Edson McCann. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. My nerves throbbed with the prickling of an infinity of needles. I was cold, colder than I had ever been, and over everything else came the insistent, blurred voice of Luigi Zorchi. Wheels, wheels. At first, it was an annoyance. Then, abruptly. Full consciousness came rushing back, bringing some measure of triumph with it. It had worked. My needling of Defoe and my concealing of Zorchi's ability to revive himself had succeeded in getting us all put into Bay 100, where the precious hypodermic and fluid were hidden. After being pushed from pillar to post and back, even that much success was enough to shock me into awareness. My heart was thumping like a rusty cargo steamer in a high sea. My lungs ached for air and burned when they got it. But I managed to open my eyes to see Zorchi bending over me. Beyond him, I saw the blue-lighted, sterilizing lamps, the door that opened from inside, and the racked suspendees of Bay 100. It is time! But now, finally, you awake! You move! Zorchi grumbled. The body of Zorchi does not surrender to poisons. It throws them off. But then, because of these small, weak legs, I must wait for you. Come, Wheels, no more dallying. We have still work to do to escape this abomination. I sat up clumsily, but the drugs seemed to have been neutralized. I was on the bottom tier, and I managed to locate the floor with my legs and stand up. Thanks, Zorchi, I told him trying to avoid looking at his ugly naked body and the things that were almost his legs. "'Thanks are due,' he admitted. "'I am a modest man who expects no praise, but I have done much. I cannot deny it. It took greatness to crawl through this bay to find you. On my hands and these baby knees, wheels I crawled, almost. I am overcome with wonder at so heroic, but I digress.' Wheels, waste no more time in talking. We must revive the others, who are above my reach. Then let us, for God, go and find food. Somehow, though I was still weak, I managed to follow Zorchi and drag down the sacks containing Reina and Carmody. And while waiting for them to revive, I began to realize how little chance we would have to escape this time, naked and uncertain of what state affairs were in. I also realized what might happen if Lawton or Defoe decided to check up on Bay 100 now. For the few minutes while Reyna revived and recognized me, and while I explained how I'd figured it out, it was worth any risk. Then, finally, Carmody stirred and sat up. Maybe we looked enough like devils in a blue hell to justify his first expression. He wasn't much like my mental image of the great mill in Carmody. His face was like his picture, but it was an older face, and haggard under the ugly light. Age was heavy on him, and he couldn't have been a noble figure at any time. Now he was a pot-bellied little man with scrawny legs and a faint tremble to his hands. But there was no fat in his mind as he tried to absorb our explanations while he answered our questions in turn. He'd come to Naples, bringing his personal physician, Dr. Lawton. His last memory was of Lawton giving him a shot to relieve his indigestion. It must have been rough to wake up here after that and find what a mess had been made for the world. But he took it, and his questions became sharper as he groped for the truth. Finally he sat back, nodding sickly. Defoe, he said bitterly. Well, what do we do now, Mr. Wills? It shook me. I'd unconsciously expected him to take over at once. But the eyes of Reyna and Zorchi also turned to me. Well, there wasn't much choice. We couldn't stay there and risk discovery, nor could we hide anywhere in the clinic. When Defoe found us gone, no place would be safe. We pray. I decided. And if prayers help, maybe we'll find some way out. I can help, Carmody offered. He grimaced. 
I know this place and the combination to the private doors. Would it help if we reached the garage? I didn't know. But the garage was half a mile beyond the main entrance. If we could steal a car, we might make it. We had to try. There were sounds of activity when we opened the door. But the section we were in seemed to be filled, and the storing of suspendees had moved elsewhere. We shut and relocked the door, and followed Carmody through the seemingly endless corridors, with Zorchi hobbling along, leaning on Reina and me, and sweating in agony. We offered to carry him, but he would have none of that. We moved further and further back while the sight of Carmody's round bare bottom ahead ripped my feeling of awe for him into smaller and smaller shreds. We stopped at a door I had almost missed, and his fingers tapped out something on what looked like an ornamental pattern. The door opened to reveal stairs that led down two flights, winding around a small elevator shaft. At the bottom was a long corridor that must be the one leading underground to the garage. Opposite the elevator was another door, and Carmody worked its combination to reveal a storeroom loaded with supplies the expediters might need. He ripped a suit of the heavy gray coveralls off the wall and began donning them. Radiation suits, he explained. They were ugly things, but better than nothing. Anyone seeing us in them might think we were on official business. Zorchi shook off our help and somehow got into a pair. Then he grunted and began pulling hard pellet rifles and bandoliers of ammunition off the wall. Now, Wheels, we are prepared. Let them come against us. Zorchi is ready. Ready to kill yourself, I said roughly. Those things take practice. And again I am the freak. The case who can do nothing that humans can do. Ah, Wheels? He swore thickly, and there was something in his voice that abruptly roughened it. Never Zorchi the man. There are Sicilians who would tell you different, could they open dead mouths to speak of their downed planes. He was the best jet pilot Naples had, Reyna said quietly. It was my turn to curse. He was right. I hadn't thought of him as a man or considered that he could do anything but regrow damaged tissues. I'm sorry, Luigi. No matter, he sighed, and then shrugged. Come, take arms and ammunition, and let us be out of this place. Even the nose of Zorchi can stand only so much of the smell of assassins. We moved down the passage, staggering along for what seemed to be ours, expecting every second to run into some official or expediter force. But apparently the passage wasn't being used much during the emergency. We finally reached stairs at the other end and headed up, afraid to attract attention by taking the waiting elevator. At the top, Carmody frowned as he studied the side passages and doors. Here, I guess, he decided. This may still be a less used part of the garage. He reached for the door. I stopped him. Wait a minute. Is there any way back in once we leave? The combination will work. The master combination used by the company heads. Otherwise, these doors are practically bomb-proof. He pressed the combination and opened the door a crack. Outside, I could see what seemed to be a small section of the company carpool. There were sounds of trucks, but none of them moving nearby. I saw a few men working on trucks a distance from us. Maybe luck was on our side. I pointed to the nearest expediter patrol wagon, a small truck, really, enclosed except for the driver's seat. That one, if there's fuel, will have to act as if we had a right to it and hope for the best. Zorchi, can you manage it that far? I shall walk like a born assassin, he assured me, but sweat began popping onto his forehead at what he was offering. Yet there was no sign of the agony he must have felt as he followed and managed to climb into the back with Reyna and Carmody. The fuel gauge was at the half mark, and as yet there was no cry of alarm. I gunned the motor into life, watching the nearest workers. They looked up casually, and then went back to their business. Ahead I could see a clear lane toward the exit, with a few other trucks moving in and out. I headed for it my hair pricking at the back of my neck. 
We reached the entrance, passed through it, and were soon blending into the stream of cars that were passing the clinic on their way out for more suspension cases. The glass doors of the entrance were gone now, and workmen were putting up huge steel ones in their place, even while a steady stream of cases were hobbling or being carried into the clinic. Most of them were old or shabby, I noticed, the Class D type, the last ones to be admitted. We must have spent more time in the vault than I'd thought, and zero hour was drawing near. Beyond the clinic, the whole of Anzio was a mass of abandoned cars that seemed to stretch for miles, and the few buildings not boarded up were obviously Class D dwellings, too poor to worry about. I cursed my way through a jam-up of trucks and managed to find one of the side roads. Then I pressed down on the throttle as far as I dared without attracting attention, until I could find a safe place to turn off, with no other cars near, to see me. "'Where to?' I asked. We couldn't go back to Zorchi's, since any expediter investigation would start there. Maybe we'd never be missed, but I couldn't risk it. If we had to, we could use some abandoned villa and hide out, but I was hoping for a better suggestion. Zorchi looked blank, and Raina shrugged. "'If we could only find Nicholas,' she suggested doubtfully. I shook my head. I'd had a chance to think about that a little while the expediters took us to see Defoe, and I didn't like it. The leader of the revolution had apparently been captured by Defoe. According to Benedetto Delangela, he'd escaped. Yet Defoe hadn't tried to pump us about him. And when Benedetto set out to meet him, the expediters had descended at once. It made an ugly picture. I had no wish to go looking for the man. "'There's my place,' Carmody said finally. "'I had places all over the world kept ready for me and stocked. If Defoe let it be thought that I had retired, he must have kept them all up as I'd have done. Wait, let me orient myself. Up that road.' Places all over the world, with food that was wasted, and with servants who might never see their master. And I'd been brought up believing that the underwriters were men of quiet, simple tastes. Carmody's clay feet were beginning to crumble up to the navel. The villa was surrounded by trees, on a low hill that overlooked an artificial lake. It had been sealed off, but the combination lock yielded to Carmody's touch. There were beds made up and waiting. Freezers stocked with food that sent Zorchi into ecstasy, and even a complete file of back issues of the company paper. Carmody headed for those, with the look of a man hunting his long past. He had a lot of catching up to do. But it was the television set that interested me. It was still working, with taped material being broadcast. The appeal had been stepped up, asking for order and cooperation. I recognized the language as being pitched toward the lower classes now, though, and the clicking of a radiation counter sounded as a constant background, with occasional shots of its meter, the needle well into the danger area. Zorchi joined me and Reyna, dribbling crumbs of meat down his beard. He snorted as he caught sight of the counter. "'There is a real one in the other room, and it registers higher,' he said. "'It is interesting.' For me, of no import. Doctors whom I trust have said Defoe is wrong. My body can resist damage from radiation, and perhaps even from old age. But for you and the young lady... He shut up at my expression. But the tape cut off and a live announcer came on before I could say anything. A bulletin just in, he said, shows that the government of Naples has unanimously passed a moratorium on all contracts, obligations, and indebtedness for the duration of the emergency. The company has just followed this with a declaration that it will extend the moratorium to include all crimes against the company. During the emergency, the clinics will be available to all without prejudice, Director Defoe said today. A trap, Rayner guessed. We wouldn't have a chance anyhow. But, Tom, does the other mean that— It means your father was wrong, I answered. As of right now, and probably in every government at the same time, the company has been freed from any responsibility. 
It didn't make any difference, of course. Benedetto had expected that everyone must secretly hate the company as he did. He hadn't realized that men who have just been saved from the horrible danger of radiation death aren't going to turn against the agency that saved them. And damn it, the company was saving them, after its opponents had risked annihilation of the race. Defoe would probably make sure the suspendees were awakened at a rate where he could keep absolute power, but not from any danger of bankruptcy. Carmody had come out and listened, attracted by the broadcast radiation clicking, apparently. Now he asked enough questions to discover Benedetto's idea, and shook his head. It wouldn't work, he agreed with me. Even if I still had control, I couldn't permit such a thing. What good would it do? Could money payments make food for a revived world, Miss Delangela? Would bankrupting the only agency capable of rebuilding the earth be a thing of honor? Besides, even with what I've read, I can see no hope. There's nothing we can do. But if you can arouse the other underwriters against Defoe, she insisted, at least you can prevent his type of world. He shook his head. How? All communications are in his hands. Even if I could fly to the home office, most of the ones I could trust, and there apparently are a few Defoe hasn't been able to retire, would be scattered out of my reach. A few weeks ago, there might have been a chance. Now it's impossible. Impossible. He shook his head sadly and wandered back toward the library. I could see that in his secret thoughts, he was wishing we'd left him safely in the vault. Maybe it would have been just as well. Cheer up, I told Reyna. Carmody's an old man. Too old to think in terms of direct action, even when it's necessary. Defoe doesn't own the world yet. But later, when I located the books I wanted in the library and went out into the vine-covered bower in the formal garden, I wasn't as confident as I'd pretended. Thinking wasn't a pleasant job after all the years when I'd let others do my thinking for me. But now I had to do it for myself. Otherwise, the only alternative was to plan some means of quick death for us all before the radiation got too intense. And I couldn't accept that. Reina had managed something Mariana couldn't have conceived. She quietly relinquished her fate into my hands, gambling on me with everything she had. Whether I wanted to or not, I'd taken the responsibility. Carmody was an old man, one who hadn't been able to keep Defoe from taking over in the first place. And Zorchi, well, he was Zorchi. That night, the radiation detector suddenly took a sharp lift, its needle crossing over into the red. But it was probably only a local rise, but it didn't make my thinking any more comfortable. It was at breakfast that next morning that I finally took it up with Carmody. Just what will the situation be at the clinic after they close down? How many will be kept awake? And what about their defenses? He frowned, trying to see my idea. Then he shrugged. Too many, Tom. We had plotted out a course for such things as this a number of times in planning, and our mob psychologist warned that there'd inevitably be a few who for one reason or another wouldn't come in on time, but who would then grow desperate and try to break in. Outlaws, looters, procrastinators, fanatics, that sort. So for some time, there should be at least 20 guards kept alert, and that's enough to defend the clinic. Atomic cannon at every entrance, of course, and the clinics are bomb-proof. 20, huh? And how about Defoe and Lawton? Will they sleep? It seemed logical that they couldn't stay out of suspension for the whole 50 years or so. There'd be no profit to gaining a world after they were too old to use it. Not at first. There's a great deal of final administrative work to be done. There's a chamber equipped to keep a hundred or so men awake with radiation washed from the air and containing adequate supplies in cable contact with other clinics. They'll be there. Later, they'll take shifts with only a couple of men awake at a time, I suppose. They may age a little that way, but not much. He frowned again and then slowly nodded. It could be done if we had some way to wait safely for six months. 
Getting back in is no problem for me. It's going to be done, I told him, and a lot sooner. Are you willing to take the chance? Have I any choice? He shrugged again. Do you think I haven't been sick at the idea of a man like Defoe in command of the company for as long as he lives? Tom, my family started the company. I've got an obligation to restore it to its right course. If there's any chance of keeping Defoe from being emperor of the world, I've got to take it. If you can put me in a position where I can get the honest underwriters together again, where we can set up the company as it was, why? So this will happen all over again? He looked shocked at Rena's question. I don't blame you for being bitter, Miss Delangela, but with Defoe gone, the company made Defoe possible. In fact, it made him and Slavetsky inevitable, I told him flatly. That's its one great crime. However, you take power completely out of the hands of the many, it winds up in fewer and fewer hands. Those histories I was reading last night proved that. Carmody, what do you know about your own company? Or the world? Leave the consolidation of power in company hands out of it, and what has happened to progress? He frowned. Well, we've leveled off a bit. We had to. We couldn't risk... Exactly. You couldn't risk research that would lead to increased longevity. Too many pensioners. You couldn't risk going to Mars. Unpredictable dangers. You had to make the world fit actuarial charts. I remember seeing one of the first suspendees awakened. He expected things we could have done fifty years ago, and never will do. How many men today work their way out of their class? And why have classes so rigidly stratified? I've been reading your own speeches of nearly fifty years ago. I've got them here, together with some tables. Like to see them? He took the papers silently and began going through them, his shock giving way to a grudging realization. Maybe without the jolt of his awakening he'd have laughed them off, but nothing was easy to dismiss with the hell brewing outside. At last he looked up. Tom, I'll admit the many times when I've been worried, I've considered starting research again countless times. I've been aware that dependence was growing too heavy on the company. But we can't just toss it aside. It did bring an end to major war, when such a war would have ruined the earth completely. It showed that nobody had to starve, that hardly anyone had to lack for any necessity, or die for lack of care. You can't throw that away. You can throw away its unrelated power. I knew I didn't have the answers. All this had been growing slowly in my mind since I'd first found Benedetto a political prisoner. But a lifetime wasn't enough to think it out, even with the books I'd found. But I had to try. In the Middle Ages, they had morality and politics tied into one bundle, Carmody. The church ruled. It wasn't good, and they finally had to divorce church and state. Maybe the same applies to administrative politics and economics. The company has shown what can be done economically. The church has survived as a great moral force outside material power. Now let's see if we can't put things in perspective. There's a precedent. The United States, the old government, was set up on the idea of balance of power, an elected Congress for the people to handle legislative tasks, a selected president to handle executive affairs, and a judiciary mostly independent. On a world scale, as it can be done today, since the company has really made it one world, the same can be done, with something like the company to ensure economics. I suppose every man who had any idealism has thought the same, Carmody said slowly. He sighed softly. I remember trying to preach it to my father when I was just out of college. You're right. But can you set up such a perfect government? Can I? Tell me how, Tom, and I'll give you your chance, if I can. Zorchi laughed cynically, but that was what I'd hoped Carmody might say. All right, I told him. We can't do it. No one man is fit to rule, ever, or to establish rule. 
Oh, I had wish dreams a few days ago, I suppose, about what I'd do, if. But men have set out to establish new systems before and done good jobs of it. Read the Constitution, a system put together artificially by expert political thinkers and good for two hundred years, at least. And they didn't have our opportunities. For the first time, the world has to wait. Get the best mind you can, Carmody. Give them twenty-five years to work it out. They can come up with an answer. And then, when the world is awakened, you can start with it fresh, without upsetting any old order. Is that your answer? Most of it. There was a sudden light in his old eyes. Yes, the sleep does make the chance possible. But how are you going to get the experts and assemble them? I pointed to Zorchi. Hermes, the messenger of the gods. He's a jet pilot who can get all over the world. And he can move outside without needing to worry about radiation. So, Zorchi snorted again, so I am now your messenger, Wheels. Do you think I would trouble myself so much for all of you, Wheels? I grinned at him. You defiantly speak of being a man. That makes you part of the human race. I'm simply taking you at your word. So, he repeated, his face wooden. Such a messenger would have much power, Wheels. Suppose I chose to be Zorchi the ruler. Not while Zorchi the man is also Zorchi the freak, I said with deliberate cruelty. Go look at yourself. And suddenly he smiled, his lips drawing back from his teeth. Wheels, for the first time you are honest, and for that as well as that I am a man, I will be Zorchi the messenger. But first, should we not decide on a plan of action? Or do we first rule and then conquer? We wait first, I told him. On the wall, the radiation indicator clicked steadily, its needle moving further into the red. End of chapter 17